Thank you. This is Steve McMillan, Chairman of the Finance and Capital Committee. Welcome to our July 9th meeting. Just a reminder to everyone who's not speaking, please mute yourself so we don't have any background noise. Uh, I trust everyone has had a chance to review today's agenda. If there are no objections, we will consider it approved as presented. Any objections? Okay, the agenda is approved. We also have the minutes from our previous meeting before us for approval. Are there any objections to the minutes as presented? Hearing none, we will consider the minutes approved as presented. Uh, we have two items on today's agenda. Uh, first, staff is seeking three approvals from the committee involving the joint development at New Carrollton Station, the public hearing staff report for the proposed changes to parking facilities, an amendment to the joint development agreement, and a budget addition for a new parking structure. These actions will allow for significant joint development at New Carrollton, one of the nation's, uh, one of the region's premier transit hubs. Uh, and second, staff will update the committee on Metro sustainability initiatives and outline progress and upcoming planned actions. So first we will turn to Ms. Albert to discuss New Carrollton and uh, board members. Uh, this is uh, a bit of a refresher for us. We received a briefing on much of the substance of this topic back in February when we approved the um, uh, going out for public comments. So um, keep that in mind as we um, uh, listen and uh, come up with questions from Ms. Albert. Thank you. Go ahead, Nina. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Um, uh, as um, the committee chairman mentioned, uh, this action item has three subcomponents to it. Uh, the first is board approval of the compact public hearing staff report, um, which uh, the board approved our hosting or holding a compact public hearing earlier this year. Uh, because of the results of uh, the recommendations within the staff report, um, we are seeking to uh, get board approval to seek, uh, sorry, to execute an amendment to the joint development agreement. And then lastly, um, uh, we're looking to increase the FY21 uh, capital budget and six year capital improvement program uh, again, as a result of some of the updates to the joint development plan. Next slide. Okay. Uh, there's a long history uh, at New Carrollton. In fact, uh, joint development at New Carrollton has been conceived as early on as 1982. Um, New Carrollton is at the confluence of a number of different transportation providers. Uh, first is Metro, obviously, uh, not only Metro Rail, Metro Bus is also uh, has a significant hub there because it is an end of line station. Uh, the bus uh, that is uh, the local bus service provided by Prince George's County uh, also uses this station. And then there are also, um, it is a station for Amtrak as well as Mark. Um, so there's quite a bit of transportation activity uh, at New Carrollton. And so as early as 1982, uh, there was uh, an agreement to build more parking garages uh, at New Carrollton to accommodate um, the volume of uh, transportation commuters and users, uh, as well as to try and remove some of the surface parking lots and put them into structured parking. Um, so that started in 1982, where Metro entered into a lease with Prince George's County, and they constructed a 1,000 space parking garage. Um, uh, we issued a joint development solicitation in 2010. Uh, the board approved the execution of the joint development agreement, and this is with Urban Atlantic uh, back in 2015. And then phase one of the joint development um, has um, been underway. Uh, a new office building has already uh, delivered and opened and is occupied by Kaiser Permanente. Uh, that was back in April of 2019. And then uh, there's currently a uh, multifamily building under construction. In May of last year, uh, WMATA, 
uh, selected New Carrollton as the site for its Maryland office building as part of our office consolidation project. Um, so now we're ready to move into what we call phase two, uh, which would require the uh, removal of um, another surface parking lot. Um, in January of 2020, uh, we brought to the board um, uh, the request to authorize a compact uh, public hearing. Uh, we conducted that in April. Um, and uh, through that process and in preparation uh, for this uh, board um, action, uh, we received county executive uh, and the, the county council's uh, letters of support uh, for some of the actions of today's agenda. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned earlier that New Carrollton uh, is next to Union Station, probably the most uh, active um, transit hub with the confluence of so many different providers uh, in the region, within the region. Prince George's County, uh, several years ago, identified uh, New Carrollton as a commercial node um, and commercial core. So just the same way that Montgomery County um, has both Bethesda and Silver Spring as major um, commercial uh, centers uh, within the county. Uh, Fairfax County um, uh, has uh, Tyson's as one and, um, you know, uh, um, now with Crystal City also becoming, uh, you know, a, a, another major commercial core. You can see throughout the region, um, not only is Washington, D.C., of course, um, you know, the epicenter of the region, but there's multiple commercial nodes throughout the system and throughout our region. And so Prince George's County, uh, in addition to Largo and all the activity happening there, um, there's a lot of activity uh, clearly um, around um, uh, College Park, but New Carrollton, because of its um, co-location with so many transportation providers, uh, is another commercial core that the county is promoting. Uh, I, as, as I had mentioned, uh, the developer uh, has a vision for developing more than 2.4 million square feet here. Um, this is what the site currently looks like. As you can see, there's a number of surface parking lots, um, and then there's two existing parking garages, one owned by Metro, the other one owned by Prince George's County. Um, the private on the far left, the private garage um, and the Kaiser Permanente office building are already uh, built and the Stella uh, is already under construction. Uh, what we brought to the public uh, in this last compact uh, hearing are proposed changes uh, to the remaining surface parking lots. And what we're looking to do here is to uh, have as full development as possible, mixed use development on the sites that we've identified in the middle of the image called the bus loop and kiss and ride lot, um, park and ride lot number two, and the east lot. Um, and what we're looking to do is consolidate all of those transit facilities, both the bus loop uh, and the parking into a single pad, which is now identified as the county garage. The county garage, as I mentioned, was built in 1984. It has a number of different improvements that continue to need to be made to it to maintain its safe condition. And so what we're looking to do is consolidate all of that into one lot, freeing up um, those three middle parcels or surface lots for development. Next slide. And so this is what the updated development vision would be. You can see uh, in blue and in the foreground where Metro's new office building would go. Uh, the developer has committed to delivering the phase two multifamily building just behind it in yellow um, a year after they begin construction uh, of our office building. So you can start to see uh, a mixed use development uh, coming, um, coming alive here. Um, by consolidating all of the parking uh, that is now indicated as East Lot multifamily, as well as the bus loop, um, which is where these two new 
uh, outlined in blue but indicated in white, two new uh, office pads would be. We have now allowed not only for the development of Metro's office and the phase two multifamily, which has always been cont contemplated in the joint development, but we're allowing the full build out of the East lot, uh, which is uh, again, just growing that urban core around the Metro station. Um, but you're also allowing two brand new pads right at the foot of the Metro station entrance to further create a, a, a pedestrian and urbanized environment and to minimize the impact of surface parking. So there's benefits all around. Um, this plan, uh, just even in the next four years, will deliver more than 1,200 employees at New Carrollton, as well as 650 new residents. So that's in the immediate and what we know to be certain. Um, but the plan also catalyzes uh, development around the metro station and off metro property. And so there is already in planning 6.3 million square feet within walking distance of the New Carrollton Metro. Um, I'm not saying that these are financed and funded, but these are entitled and are, are shovel ready. Um, and then as I mentioned, the creation of those two new office pads where the current bus loop is and the development on the east lot is going to generate uh, above and beyond what we first estimated with the joint development of 883 new daily boardings um, and $95 million in additional revenue in the form of parking revenue, real estate revenue, and ridership revenue to Metro over the next 20 years. We also did an analysis of what the um, development fees um, and a variety of different taxes would be to Prince George's County over the next 20 years as a result um, of this change. Uh, and it's approximately $124 million, again, in a variety of different uh, types of uh, revenue sources for the county. So as to the approvals that we're seeking, um, we held the compact public hearing on April 27th. Um, we shared what these plans are that I just discussed um, and um, affiliated with the staff uh, recommendations is um, uh, not only the approval of the staff report, uh, but also changes to the mass transit plan. Um, we would be ultimately uh, removing uh, 33 space kiss and ride lot without replacing it because there's already a kiss and ride lot in our existing garage that is highly underutilized. Um, so kiss and ride will still be available and we don't need um, these additional 33 uh, kiss and ride spaces to be replaced. Uh, we would look to remove permanently uh, park and ride lot two and the east and the parking uh, surface parking on the east lot and in its place uh, constructing a new 1900 space parking garage. The net increase to Metro's own parking inventory, uh, because as I mentioned, there is a thousand space uh, Prince George's County garage, we would be replacing that garage um, and bringing that into Metro's inventory. Uh, so the net result to us is 600 uh, new uh, park and ride spaces uh, to the mass transit plan. Uh, we did a significant uh, outreach plan uh, as we're required to do. Uh, we had to do quite a bit of virtual outreach um, because of uh, COVID-19, uh, but we were able to uh, provide web page announcements, emails, do all of the targeted uh, marketing uh, and media that we always do. And then um, instead of an in-person public hearing, we had to do a telephonic public hearing, and that was held on April 27th. Um, we had um, online surveys that we pushed to people uh, to try and get responses. The total number of responses through all these different venues uh, was 26, so not uh, so many. Um, I do think that the public has been informed over the years of this project. Um, and so uh, this was not a surprise to the communities uh, around the New Carrollton Metro Station. Uh, we received one telephone message, um, which is how the public provided input during the public hearing, 16 online surveys, eight written responses, and like I mentioned, some letters of support from the county. 
Um, the types of comments that we received uh, fold into three uh, different buckets. Um, the first was concerns about the impact to Metro's own facilities. So there were comments that um, there wasn't adequate parking period, even with the surface lots available. Um, there tends to always be a preference um, among the parking public for surface lots rather than garages, and that's because of the ease and convenience of a surface lot. Uh, and then there was a question about uh, how these plans would impact the purple line. Um, so we studied as a staff all of the utilization of parking um, on the south side and on the north side, and um, we are able to replace with this plan uh, one for one all of the utilized uh, parking. Uh, we are not um, uh, re proposing to replace one for one vacant parking spaces. Um, and then as for impacts to the purple line, uh, all of these changes are taking place on the south side of the station or otherwise known as the east side of the station. And there will be, that is not where the purple line is. The purple line is on the other side and this, these plans won't have any impact to the purple line. Um, some folks did comment on the Metro garage uh, saying that it's overutilized and congested. Uh, again, through our analysis and knowledge of how the garage is utilized, we know that the Metro garage has capacity. Um, uh, in this project, we would actually seek to improve some of the internal circulation in the uh, existing Metro garage um, because we're aware of some congestion. Uh, and then lastly, um, people are supportive of the development um, and uh, they encouraged us to consider as many sustainability elements uh, to the new garage. Um, uh, and so uh, those things are already on our mind, although uh, we always appreciate it when the public uh, is aware of and prioritizes sustainability. So we're looking at bike storage, LED lighting, and I think that there's opportunity for other kinds of sustainable elements as well. Um, so uh, in the prior um, agenda item, uh, just to recap, we're seeking board approval of the compact public hearing staff report. If that is approved, um, there's um, related approvals to and amendments to the joint development agreement. Uh, we would like to include uh, those two new pads. Um, under the joint development agreement with the existing developer. The reason to have this developer develop those two new pads is because the site is being planned as a master plan and um, the branding and marketing for all of New Carrollton should be done by one entity. Uh, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't hire uh, another vertical developer to develop those pads, um, but we believe that the marketing, the branding should all be done by one master developer and that it should be the one that we selected in 2015. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, and so um, the other thing too is that we've been able to uh, revise compensation uh, to improve um, our compensation over time through the ground leases. Okay, next. Um, and then moving to the last agenda item, which is um, our funding of the new 1900 space garage. Um, just as background, uh, WMATA is obligated to contribute to any capital improvements uh, to the existing county garage. Um, so we've just recently made a capital improvement to address immediate safety concerns. Um, because of the deterioration of that 1984 garage, we are anticipating there will continue to need to be to have um, capital improvements made to the existing garage uh, just because of uh, the age of it. So um, by building a new garage, of course, we're making investments in a new facility that better meets our needs rather than continuing to patch an old facility. Um, this capital investment is fairly unique in that as I mentioned, this will result in 95, approximately 94 or 95 million dollars of new revenue through all different varieties, not only parking revenue, but real estate revenue and new fare revenue generated by the real estate development. Um, and then as a theme uh, that you will continue to hear from the real estate uh, office is development on the east side of the system continues to be a priority of ours because it allows that counter commute activity uh, from the core of the system and from the 
from the west side of the system, which helps us. Uh, uh, we're already running trains, and so we want to get that new fare um, revenue um, without incurring more cost. Next. So um, in terms of um, the new garage, um, it is approximately an $80 million project. Um, this is rough order of magnitude. Um, and uh, the reason to do it now is that New Carrollton is gonna be under construction with the build out of phase two. Um, so we're gonna be removing parking. And what we wanna do is have all of the construction activity on the south side of the system or of the station done at once to minimize impact to customers and be able to come online um, with uh, the full uh, uh, replacement parking program that customers expect today. That's important to do because it's an end of line station um, and there's higher demand for parking at those stations. Um, the way it uh, flushes out over the three years is an increase to the FY21 budget by $11 million to the 22 budget by 45 million and in FY23 by $22.8 million. Um, and then uh, just to make sure everybody understands, um, we would in the, the way we would accommodate this um, change is by increasing the plan dedicated funding debt, uh, not by uh, seeking increases to the jurisdictional uh, capital contribution. With that, uh, we're seeking approval of these three items, and I'll um, answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Albert. Um, before we begin discussion, can I get a motion and a second from committee members? Mr. Chairman, this is Jeff Marudi, and I will make a motion. Second. Uh, Thank you, and second from Mr. Smedberg. So now we will move to questions and comments. Um, uh, Secretary Slater, given the location, do you wanna kick this off or? Uh... I, I mean, I, I have a few questions. First, uh, I, found, I think I got one answer, which was really, I wanted to understand the nature of the public input that you were getting. It, it seems to be uh, across the board pretty supportive. Uh, I think this is pretty transformational for that area, and I think it's, uh, a great addition to that uh, region. Um, but um, so you did get a letter of support from the county executive? Yes, we did. Great, great. thank you. Uh, the, the only other question I had is, you know, where are we in terms of understanding any kind of disruption that might happen to uh, our customers during construction itself? Yeah, so uh, we have, oh, sorry. We have um, a uh, temporary parking plan. Um, so anytime uh, we undergo construction for joint development, we always work with the developer to identify uh, where exactly uh, temporary facilities are going to be housed. So in this particular case, we actually have um, enough parking in the um, between the east lot, which is not going to be developed right away, uh, the privately owned garage uh, that's owned by Urban Atlantic uh, near the Kaiser Permanente building. Uh, also in Metro's existing garage. And then if there's continued overflow parking need, there's actually quite a few private surface parking lots right in the vicinity and within walking distance of the Metro station. But we also can divert parkers and offer them parking at Landover Metro station, which is only um, about a third of a mile down the road. So there are options uh, to make sure that uh, the commuting public can continue to access the station during construction. Great, thank you. I was just, uh, the, the only further question I have is just more of a statement of, you know, I think we're, we're looking at a quite a long construction duration uh, and trying to maintain our ridership at the same time, but also uh, I would encourage you to put a lot of thought into kind of the pedestrian safety side uh, during construction. It's gonna be uh, a lot going on in an area where we're gonna have a, a lot of activity for pedestrians and and that's always a challenge in construction zones. So I would encourage you to really put a lot of thought into that and, and engage our riders in that. Okay, we'll do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Secretary Slater. Uh, I'll turn to myself next. Um, not a question so much, but uh, just a comment to highlight the financial slide that was towards the end there for the benefit of my fellow board members. Um, 
this is an addition to the capital program. Uh, this is not something that was um, uh, included in the um, capital program that we approved and funded previously. And so uh, to fully execute our capital program, we are reliant in part, uh, in large part on uh, jurisdictional contributions and federal grants, but also on uh, a, a new um, uh, debt financing tool that we have uh, implemented for the first time this year. And in fact, uh, we will, as I understand it, plan to go back to the markets later in fiscal 2021 uh, to uh, continue to provide the financing necessary for that. So um, we are with this action today, uh, increasing the program and adding to um, the uh, the draw on that um, uh, on that bond financing that we've begun to access this year. So um, I just I'll just leave it at that. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Marudian, any questions or comments? Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Smadberg. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Uh, Ms. Albert, uh, just a quick question about the increase in the budget, the seventy nine million. Could you just give us a little more detail on that, uh, sort of the analysis that went into that? I know it's a question that people had, um, you know, given the size increase. Um, Are your questions about um, the cost of the project? The cost of the project, yeah. Okay. How did that compare to other things you've done in the past? Are you yeah. you're feeling comfortable with that figure, bringing mm -hmm. the recommendation forward, but any more detail you can give us on that? To... Sure, um, I, I'd be happy to. Um, it's an unusual garage uh, for a couple different reasons. Uh, what we're proposing to do, and to tell you the truth, um, to the extent that there are other projects where, if, if this turns out to be a, a good model, which I believe it will be, um, but to consolidate all the transit facilities, particularly the bus uh, loop and facility uh, covered by parking, uh, that does add cost because the buses require uh, higher floor to ceiling heights than, for example, a car. So that first floor, that ground level floor is going to be higher. Um, this project's a little bit special in that it includes Greyhound and some other national um, transportation providers. And so we would want to build out, and we have a lease with them, uh, we would want to build out um, some waiting room space and retail space, and that could also be a benefit to our bus uh, users as well. Um, so, and then the developer is interested in including some retail uh, to just bring some uh, dynamicism uh, to that ground floor plane. Um, uh, but then above it is a 1900 space garage. Again, a little unusual in size, quite large. Um, so, and then there's also some offsite improvements that need to be made to the road network, including um, there is already a light intersect, um, a, a lighted, uh, a red light system uh, at one of the intersections, uh, but we would need to um, likely make some changes to that. And then lastly, as I mentioned before, this budget includes some improvements to our existing uh, WMATA garage. And that is not to the structure itself, but to the ground floor. So we're looking to improve ingress and egress and utilization of the kiss and ride. So it's a little extraordinary um, in um, you know, the cost per space if you were to exclusively look That's at right. that uh, analysis. But when you look at the scope of what we're trying to accomplish to make uh, these two garages handle all of the commuter traffic, um, as well as uh, include things like um, uh, you know, EV parking spaces, uh, potentially, and we've included things like uh, potentially including the infrastructure for electric buses. Um, and so that num number that I gave you, that 80 million, uh, is a rough order of magnitude that would include the scope of all of that. Um, and we will be value engineering as we go along to try and bring that cost down. Okay. Uh yeah, that's fine. I, you know, just, you know, given the size of that amendment and or suggestion there and, you know, given where we are right now, people, you know, just had questions about that. Uh, not opposed to it necessarily, but just wanted to have a little better understanding of what that figure is. So is that uh, you're, you're going to value engineer, mm -hmm. uh, but is that 
a locked in price? Uh, did you work with the developer on, you know, regardless of what happens that that's the price or um, how, how are you moving forward? Yeah, so that's going to be our, our build to what we call the build to budget. Build uh, to, the, develop, yeah. mm -hmm, the developer has not yet uh, selected a general contractor. We haven't begun that process um, yeah. until we understood what the board's position was going to be. Um, so this is a preliminary price, not based on real pricing in the market. Um, so ultimately, we need to design the project and then um, have a general contractor work with the developer on um, exactly pricing it. But we, we uh, this again is a rough order of magnitude and we will uh, work as hard as we can, not only to stay within this budget, uh, but potentially even achieve some savings against it. Okay, so potentially more, potentially less. <laughs> Yes, it's always the case. Uh, we're early on in the right, construction right. process, but we, we don't, I mean, we, you know, we went conservative with uh, bringing this to you today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. That's it. Sure. Okay. Now we'll turn to uh, other members of the board, uh, Mr. Horner. Uh, thank you. Um, Nina, thanks. A great presentation, very thorough and uh, complex topic. I'm not fully across it. Uh, since there's a lot to study, but I wanted to ask um, initially in, in broad terms to what extent the uh, WMATA's financing, um, excluding um, the allocation of proceeds from the dedicated uh, funding bonds uh, depends on, well, first let me put it differently, to what extent is WMATA financing any of this by means other than uh, a contribution of proceeds from the dedicated revenue bonds? Is the answer none? Or is there a separate bond issuance on top of the dedicated funding contribution? I'll um, see if um, Tom Webster's on the line to answer that specifically. Um, otherwise, I can. David, I'm fairly confident the answer is it's coming out of the dedicated funding bond revenue. Right. And I mean, to, to what extent in this deal is there um, an assumption that there will be robust user demand for transit mm -hmm. in the next 10 years. I mean, have you, to the extent there are any forecasts of ridership that are the predicate of this deal, um, have they been updated recently to take into account the step down in demand and stress tested for the possibility of a, of a, a prolonged bumping along the bottom? Right. That's a, it's a great question. Um, so we did, we looked at different alternatives and different scenarios um, for ridership. So there are a couple unique um, attributes of this particular station. So in terms of, uh, did we underestimate demand um, for parking and are we underbuilding? The thing that's really interesting about New Carrollton is that there's another side of the station. So if in fact, over time, uh, we have not built enough parking uh, because as I mentioned, we're gonna be not replacing one for one all of the available parking now, um, but only meeting current demand uh, for parking. So if we didn't build enough, we actually have the other side of the station and there's space uh, where we could build another garage if we needed to. So um, I don't believe that we are um, under parking it, but if that proves wrong over time, then there is another location to provide parking at this end of line station. So that's one question. The other is the flip, which is um, what if we are overbuilding and there isn't enough transit demand either in the near term uh, or over the long term because parking trends change. What's very interesting about um, New Carrollton is that there is a very, very high non-rider usage of our parking facilities. So because there's already to date about 6,000 employees in the immediate vicinity. Um, and like I said, in the future, uh, potentially up to 6.3 million square feet off of Metro parking. Um, we estimated uh, historically that about 28% of all of our parkers are non-riders. They're coming and parking at Metro because it's convenient. Um, and those are not commuter uh, parkers. So uh, on the flip, I think we're gonna have, and we're also planning to design to accommodate uh, Amtrak and Mark riders, but Amtrak in particular uh, is multi-day parking potentially. Um, so we can, with the facility, we can accommodate um, non-Metro riders as well in case Metro ridership lags over time. 
Got it. So um, do, do we or the developer bear the risk of the flip? Is it in terms of finance? What, what do you mean the flip? The flip that you just described, namely overbuilding. Uh, well, financially, we would bear that risk. So we're going to be putting in 80 million today, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if that doesn't bear, you know, doesn't uh, bear out, um, fortunately, in this particular situation, uh, we're not relying 100% on parking revenue. This is also opening the door for real estate revenue. So, and, and the developer is, um, you know, responsible for delivering that. But the cost today is Metro's cost, um, and it will be a partnership with the developer, with the county, to incentivize and bring um, uh, real estate development to this to this area. That's where the real revenue is, is in the ridership generated by the real estate development. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great, great answers. Thank you. Uh, next, Ms. Skidaby. Uh, thank you again for your leadership. This is definitely a solid project for the region, uh, for all the things that you mentioned. I wanted to, you hit on almost all of my sustainability except for solar. So I wanted to see if that was also part of the plan. Um, you did hit EV infrastructure with SC solar. Yeah, so as uh, you probably know, uh, today was a big announcement around um, a solar project that we're doing on the border of Washington, D.C. and Prince George's County. Uh, the Prince George's County um, Sustainability uh, Director are, has already reached out to us, very excited about the project. Um, so we definitely uh, have in mind, um, including solar or other kinds of sustainability actions. We're very early in the design process, um, but all of these things are top of mind for us, okay. um, including uh, different types of certifications. So uh, I can't commit today because I don't know but we certainly uh, are gonna be looking at all of that. Okay, and then my other piece, which is actually part of, um, is a more of a question around affordability. Um, this type of investment in a community that hasn't necessarily received these types of funding um, may often have an impact to the housing um, around the area and uh, the affordability challenges that may increase. Um, because of the amount of money that's being positioned to be placed into this area. Um, I know we talked a little bit about this when we talked about joint development, but for the public, can you talk about how Metro is working with the, the jurisdictions just to ensure that we're thinking about housing, especially given the shortage that we have in this region? Yeah, so just in terms of housing production uh, without addressing affordability yet, um, this is, again, all about more joint development that's transit proximate um, helps both in housing production, just general availability of housing, but then obviously being right next to transit gives households an opportunity if they choose not to have a vehicle to use other modes of, of transportation. So, um, but in terms of affordable, affordable housing specifically, we're working with each of the jurisdictions and want to do much more of it to understand uh, what that jurisdiction's priorities are, how they want to address affordable housing, um, and see if uh, our joint developments make sense in their agenda. Uh, Prince George's County uh, and we have started these conversations, uh, but again, there's still a little bit of time to work with the developer, Prince George's County, on the multifamily um, buildings that um, I highlighted. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next, Mr. Goldman. Are you on mute, Mike? I'm unmuted uh, now. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, I was saying, uh, no specific questions. This is a great project for Prince George's County. It's a great project for uh, Maryland. We should move it along. And uh, hopefully it complements uh, nicely some um, developments uh, in Montgomery County. Okay, I'll, there, okay. Looks yeah, like no one, no one wants to let me speak. <laughs> so anyway, it nicely complements uh, some uh, developments in Montgomery County this week dealing with uh, development of uh, WMATA owned properties along the uh, red line, uh, which will both contribute to uh, benefit of Metro increased ridership as well as uh, low income housing. 
as well. And hopefully in the fall, Nina will be able to uh, address some of those developments uh, on the Montgomery County end of Maryland, um, as well as this project in Prince George's County. So thank you and let's move it along. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Letourneau. Nothing for me. Thank you. Great. All right. With that, uh, I will close discussion on this item and ask the board corporate secretary to administer a roll call vote. Director McMillan. Aye. Alternate Director Meridian. Aye. Director Slater. Aye. Director Smedberg. Aye. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Great. And uh, at this time, uh, before moving to our next agenda item, I'm told we need to take a quick pause to address a technical matter. So uh, those of you watching, stay tuned and we'll be back momentarily. This is uh, Steve McMillan again. We're gonna continue with the, uh, the second item on our committee's agenda today, sustainability update from Tom Webster. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, this afternoon, we will discuss Metro's role in the sustainability of our region, progress in delivering sustainability initiatives, and outline uh, some of our next steps. Uh, during this session, we will highlight Metro's energy action plan and energy uh, savings initiatives, provide updates on Metro's uh, zero emission bus planning, uh, investments in sustainability through our capital program and our new solar power agreement. Metro plays a vital role in the region's economic prosperity, livability and accessibility, as well as in our region's environmental impacts. <laughs> Every day, Metro um, helps people get to work, school, home, healthcare facilities, grocery stores, and many other important destinations. And as we've seen during the pandemic, many of these trips are essential. And many trips are taken by members of our communities with limited or no other uh, viable transportation options. Riding Metro provides a uh, far smaller environmental footprint for riders than driving uh, for residents and visitors of the region. And every rider who travels on um, Metro bus and Metro rail supports cleaner air, healthier communities and a more equitable, equitable and economically successful region. Sustainability is at the core of uh, the service Metro provides and it's also at the heart of how we provide that service. Um, sustainability is also a fundamental business and decision-making approach uh, to make Metro operations safer, reliable, more resilient, and more fiscally responsible. With that in mind, um, over the past several years, we've developed um, specific tangible action plans to advance sustainability initiatives, including our energy action plan, uh, the zero emission bus plan, and specific capital project investments, uh, including lighting upgrades, replacement maintenance and operation facilities, and other projects. We've also engaged stakeholders and our customers in new ways through reporting, uh, outreach and marketing, highlighting their roles in the region's sustainability. In 2019, uh, Metro established our first ever energy action plan. Uh, it's a detailed roadmap to reduce energy use, cut greenhouse gas emissions, save energy and reduce operating costs. Um, as a transportation provider, Metro is one of the single largest energy user, users in the region. We use energy, um, electricity, compressed natural gas, diesel fuel, and gasoline to power rail cars, buses, stations, and facilities. The Energy Action Plan includes uh, the implementation of efficiency investments, uh, the modernization of our design, construction, and operational practices, and um, engaging proactively in the energy market. Energy Action Plan established an energy savings target by 2025 uh, compared to our business as usual projections. And through investments and changes in practices, we estimate that we're 21% of the way towards meeting that target uh, through FY 
2019. As a result of these efficiency upgrades um, and rebates, we estimate that we avoided approximately 3 million in energy costs in FY 2019. Going forward, we will continue um, the station and facility LED lighting upgrades as that's a major contributor to energy and long-term maintenance cost avoidance. And we're also incorporating traction power energy recovery technologies into the traction power rehabilitation and state of good repair program. And through our capital program, we will continue to advance additional projects and elements of projects to reduce energy usage and reduce future operating costs. Over time, Metro has converted the bus fleet of over 1,500 buses uh, from legacy transit buses to alternative fuel type and lower environmental impact buses, including compressed natural gas and more efficient clean diesel buses. We've now begun a, um, planning for a potential transition to a zero emission bus fleet. Um, earlier this year, we published a uh, progress update that highlights the opportunities that zero emission bus could offer the region and considers the market, infrastructure, financial, and policy requirements for success. Uh, transition to a zero emission bus fleet could offer many benefits to the region, including cleaner air, reduced emissions, and reduced greenhouse gases. Um, zero emission buses would be quieter and a more comfortable ride for customers. Uh, they would also decrease the use of fossil fuels and lower fuel costs and have the potential um, over the long term to reduce maintenance and operations costs. Um, importantly, this effort is um, much more uh, than about buying um, electric buses. A large scale um, zero emission bus deployment will require substantial regional capital investment in grid infrastructure, facilities, equipment, as well as the vehicles. Um, our regional and utility partners will also need to establish uh, predictable and affordable rate structures for a large scale deployment. To advance uh, zero emission bus planning, Metro has developed an electric bus test and evalu evaluation program. Um, and we were recently awarded a $4 million FTA grant, a competitive grant to support this work. Uh, combined with regional funding from the capital program, this grant funding will allow us to test electric buses and charging technology at the Shepherd Parkway bus division in the District of Columbia. There's also a significant opportunity to link uh, potential electric and other zero emission bus investments uh, to bus priority investments, including de dedicated travel lanes for buses. We're also designing um, the uh, replacement bus divisions at Northern and Bladensburg to be electric bus ready. And going forward, uh, we will continue our engagement with our uh, regional partners and stakeholders um, in these efforts, and we'll continue to emphasize um, the importance of continuously reducing the impact of the bus fleet on our environment. Metro is also focused on uh, sustainability, resiliency, and fiscal responsibility and in investment decision making, uh, recognizing that major capital projects and other investments are um, are all potential opportunities to affect our to affect our environmental impact. Uh, reduce energy use, reduce long-term operating and maintenance costs, and improve the customer experience. Um, Metro is nearly 100% complete with LED lighting upgrades at platforms in underground stations. The upgraded lighting um, improves illumination levels, safety, security, reduces energy use, and reduces life cycle costs. Uh, another, another major cyclical capital program is nearly three quarters complete as we are replacing aging uh, station chiller equipment with um, efficient state-of-the-art technology, improving the customer experience, and, and again, reducing energy use and, and life cycle costs of the equipment. Last year, um, Andrews Federal uh, Center Bus Division in Prince George's County opened and it was awarded uh, LEED Silver certification. Uh, looking ahead, um, we are uh, designing the new Potomac Yard Station uh, the Northern and Bladensburg replacement bus divisions and our consolidated office buildings to achieve LEED certification. Again, uh, primarily with a focus on environmental impact, efficiency, life cycle costs, and, and of course, working conditions for our employees and our contractors. Um, Metro is also advancing projects uh, and initiatives in solar and other renewable energy. Uh, the new solar lease agreements announced um, yesterday, last night, uh, will agree, will um, generate about uh, 15 million kilowatt hours of energy annually. It's 
enough to power about 1,200 uh, single family homes. Um, the agreements will uh, also importantly provide annual lease revenue to Metro's operating budget. Uh, these new solar installations will be located um, above parking lots and garages at Anacostia, Chevrolet, Naylor Road, and Southern Avenue stations. And uh, combined, these solar installations will be one of the largest solar installations in the region. Uh, Metro partnered with the uh, General Services Administration to cooperatively, uh, competitively and cooperatively bid our uh, most recent, recent natural, natural gas supply contract. Um, and our team is uh, active in our regional energy policy groups and continues to work to form partnerships for um, strategic energy purchasing. We're um, also continuing to assess the market for additional solar investments, as, as Nita mentioned in our, in our um, uh, previous item. We will soon be issuing um, a request for proposals for a renewable natural gas commodity swap. Uh, looking ahead, um, management will continue uh, the implementation of um, projects and initiatives in the Energy Action Plan. Uh, we will advance the zero emission um, bus uh, planning and um, test and evaluation program in partnership uh, with the region and utilities. And we will continue to advance uh, sustainability improvements through our capital program. Um, in recent years, many uh, public transit agencies, uh, state and local governments, and, and corporations have adopted uh, organizational sustainability policies, including many um, in, the, in the Washington region. Um, and this fall, uh, we will recommend a sustainability policy for the board's consideration, and we look forward to supporting the board in that discussion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Webster. Uh, just briefly for from me, uh, I, I do want to compliment two aspects uh, of the uh, uh, initiative and the presentation. First of all, the uh, focus on uh, uh, finding those opportunities where um, uh, we can get a good uh, uh, return on investment for these, uh, uh, both financially and in um, uh, uh, achieving the benefits of um, uh, lower energy use. Uh, and secondly, uh, as we're engaging in uh, these major capital investments, making sure that um, these considerations are uh, taken into the planning process on the front end and uh, integrated into the uh, uh, early planning process for uh, maximum efficiency. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, next, I'll turn to Mr. Meridian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Tom, for that uh, great presentation. Uh, as, uh, as you may know, Mayor Bowser has a, uh, a fairly aggressive uh, clean energy DC plan, um, which I think works very well with, with many of uh, WMATA's objectives here that you've outlined. Um, so I really want to just uh, one commend uh, Manuel Mata on uh, the solar announcement. I think it's a, a step in the right direction and, and we're eager to, to continue to partner on those kinds of uh, forward looking uh, deployments that will really help move everything uh, forward. So I uh, just wanted to, to say thank you uh, for, for the work that you're doing. It's uh, as we've talked about before, uh, there's a lot of elements to electrifying a fleet that go beyond just the acquisition of buses. And I know that uh, you're thinking very hard about what all of those steps are. And so the district is uh, is eager to continue to partner with you on, on these efforts. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, next, Secretary Slater. Thank you. And, and thank you, Tom. Sorry. We that. lost you for a sec there, Greg. Sorry. It told me the host muted me. So uh, just real quick, uh, great presentation. Uh, my question is on the, uh, the zero emission bus side and kind of that conversion. I know, you know, really kind of building on what uh, uh, Mr. Meridian had just uh, mentioned about kind of the extra pieces of the infrastructure that's needed. Uh, I, I'm just kind of asking a question, thinking about kind of some of the work that we're doing here is, do you see any uh, limitations that are flagged in terms of where the that technology is right now and being able to convert the fleet at a faster pace or being able to take the demands of, of what we use? 
Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Fundamentally, we we are launching this test and evaluation program uh, for for that very reason. Um, we want to make sure that the technology is mature enough for a larger scale deployment. Um, there are, of course, um, uh, electric buses deployed elsewhere in the country and, and across the across the globe, um, but we need to, to test them in our environment and um, test a variety of interoperability and 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 as I mentioned the. The infrastructure and the facilities components of this are are um, enormous, and, and we need to make sure we have a handle on that before moving forward. Great, thanks, Tom. I know we're we're just getting ready to acquire a few for uh, some of our Baltimore system, uh, and I'd love to have our teams coordinate a little bit just to share lessons learned and and how we can get there. That sounds great. Thank you. All right, uh, next, Mr. Smedberg. Nothing for me, Mr. Chair, other than I really appreciate these efforts and I think it's really important uh, for the organization and the region in general. So thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Horner. Thanks, uh, thanks, Steve. Great presentation, Tom. Say, are you uh, comfortable previewing uh, to the board and, and the public listening or watching this meeting? Um, uh, your, think, your thinking about benchmarks or goals, how do we measure success when we're con conceiving of a sustainability plan? What, what are the that, metrics? That, that's, a, that's a great question. We are, um, uh, a number of years ago, uh, Metro uh, endeavored in an effort to lay out some, um, some long-term goals um, uh, for sustainability. We're in the process right now of, um, of revisiting and refreshing those goals and um, very much look forward to sharing that with the board um, this fall as we move forward with um, the policy discussion. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Gidaby. I am super excited about this presentation. Um, I think that this is where I hope to see Metro and really thinking about more visionary leadership so that we're not just reacting to the challenges of the moment. And um, I'm really thinking about DC's uh, clean energy plan, which is pushing us to be at 100% renewable by 2032, which is super aggressive, one of the most aggressive in the country. And so as I think about our bus uh, portfolio, um, one of my... Uh, one of the opportunities is I really hope that we really can think about how we convert the fleet faster because I'm not sure how we would be able to meet those goals if we don't. Um, well, I believe we only have two electric buses out of the 1500. So that leaves us at like less than 1% at this point. I, I, I think as we think about new flyers uh, contract and the agreements that we have with them for our next round of buses to the extent that we can really have a more I mean, definitely more than where we are now. I don't want to put out a percentage, but I'm, but I am really hoping um, that we can really think about how we change the composition numbers because I'm not sure that two is enough to get us there at this time. Um, so that that's my first comment, just really thinking about the uh, the conversion and how we're going to get there, um, especially given the contract that we've already set, signed up with with New Flyer. Um, my second comments are around just shifting to renewable energy. I think uh, as, as WMATA is one of the largest power consumers in the entire region with its own class with PEPCO, I think we can use our purchasing power to shift um, from the use of taxpayer funds to move beyond kind of dirty coal to really renewable sources of energy. And to the extent that we can think about that more specifically, I think that's something that offers a different way for us to really think about how we change the region overall, just because of the amount of energy that we consume as an agency. Um, and then overall, I just wanna thank your team for the work that they've been doing. Um, and I hope that uh, even on the joint development, since that's also part of your area, um, if we really, if we can think about how we also encourage the use of our parcels to really think about the solar pieces as already just described for some of the new initiatives that you're doing and really ensuring that private developers who are going to be building on our properties, think about those elements in addition to other green standards, I'd appreciate it. And then finally, I just wanna um, just thank you for your leadership and working with the jurisdictions um, and holding the meetings to have the discussions as to how we meet our goals overall as a region. So thank you again. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Goldman. No real questions. I uh, just want to emphasize that the board's resolution on the uh, bus transformation project uh, emphasized as a priority moving to an all electric bus fleet uh, as early as possible. And so the uh, elements on the uh, all electric bus fleet that you mentioned are encouraging and uh, things that we urge you to move forward on. Um, one of the benefits besides the pollution uh, reduction benefits to the all electric bus fleet is the uh, lower uh, maintenance costs, lower operating costs for electric buses rather than gas or diesel uh, or the uh, hybrid type buses. And so if, if that's still the, uh, the trend, which seemed to be the learning from other uh, jurisdictions over the last four or five years, that's uh, something that we should pay attention to because anything that will help us uh, reduce uh, operating costs is something that we should prioritize. While the uh, initial acquisition costs of the electric buses are seemingly a little higher, and, and perhaps that's something you can also address if, if that's still the case. Uh, the trade-off yes. long-term seems to be one that would favor moving to uh, all electric buses uh, to save on the operating cost side as quickly as we can. So thank you for that, Tom, unless you do have some direct comments that, were, that you can provide. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Um, to, your, to your specific question on the, the upfront price, yes, they are, they are still more expensive. Um, the expectation is um, over the life cycle of the bus that the cost would be lower. Um, but again, uh, the broader uh, facilities and infrastructure costs have to be factored in as well. And um, that's part of the uh, the evaluation work we're, we're kicking off now. Thank you. Hey, uh, Mr. Chairman, or Steve, it's David Horner. Could I make an informational request of Tom that's prompted by comments by, of, uh, from other board members, um, if you don't mind? Say, uh, Tom, just to help the board begin to think about benchmarking, could you provide to us an estimate of the system's uh, consumption of fossil fuels expressed in British thermal units and maybe calculate the BTU consumed per passenger mile? And yes, could, I, could, you also, could you also tell us um, where the uh, material for the batteries in the electric buses is sourced. Um, there are some jurisdictions that produce cobalt, which is the material used to fabricate these batteries um, that have uh, human rights issues. Um, Mr. Horner, we'd be happy to follow up with um, on both of those matters um, uh, after the meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and then uh, Mr. Letourneau, you're next. Yeah, very briefly. I'd also like some follow-up on the infrastructure required to advance the fleet. Um, I think sometimes we throw things out there like, you know, we want to switch to renewables, we want to move to all electric, and I do too, but I also recognize the vast, vast deficiencies in the overall network infrastructure to be able to do that, both from an electricity providing standpoint and uh, even as a wide-scale renewables deployment, lack of transmission, and so on. So um, let's also get into those issues a little bit so we fully understand what may be holding us back from this because it may not just be money. Um, it may also just be network infrastructure um, and then what, what we can do to help speed some of that stuff up. So appreciate some follow-up on that. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions and comments, that closes this uh, agenda item, and that should uh, complete the board today. So with that, uh, the committee stands adjourned. I'll turn the floor over to Chairman Smedberg, who has a request for the board to meet in executive session. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. In accordance with the bylaws, I, Paul Smedberg, request that the board of directors convene an executive session to discuss the following matters pursuant to Article 2, Paragraph 9, Subsections A, budgetary matters that may affect legal positions, WMATA contracts, or sensitive relationships with local jurisdictions or the federal government, and B, litigation, investigations, or other legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice or consultation with counsel and staff members, and C, 
Personnel or labor issues, including discussions of labor contracts and labor negotiations, consideration or interview of candidates for employment and the assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion or resignation of individuals. And D, contractual or other matters involving confidential or proprietary concerns or the investment of public funds where discussion in public would affect the financial interest of WMATA. And F, safety and security matters where premature release would compromise public safety. And H, development of WMATA position or strategy on pending or proposed federal or state <coughs> uh, legislation. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we'll reconvene in uh, five minutes. Thank you all. Thank